and what you all have to contribute as well. So uh, our first panelist is Dr. Charlotte Frisbee, who is a professor of anthropology. She joined SEM in 1962 and continues to work on gender. She also works on Native American creative expressions, ritual drama, Navajo studies, and is herself a historian of ethnomusicology. Also does work on Navajo food, sovereignty, and historic restoration. Um, and in this delightful quote, which summarizes her, quote, one of the early agitators for feminism in SEM. Um, and the title, she says she continues to do research in both ethnomusicology and Navajo studies and reminds us that she's a past president of SEM and the co-founder of Navajo Studies Incorporated. The title of her presentation is Back in the Day, Reflections from an Other. I'd like to start by thanking Sonia and Elizabeth for putting this session together and also inviting me to participate. But frankly, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know who I'm supposed to represent. Uh, maybe I, it was because I was in grad school program in the 60s. Maybe I'm the oldest on this group of four. Maybe we needed an Anglo-Saxon white girl, uh, Protestant, to be on the panel. Um, or maybe it's just because I'm an other, and I'm an other in the sense that by choice, I got my PhD in anthropology. So you pick your reason, and you know, I'm here. I said yes, <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> Reflecting on questions that Sonia caused us to think about made me think about my childhood. I grew up in Connecticut as a middle child between an older brother and a younger sister. My dad was an electrical engineer, and my mom was a music teacher who then retired to become a stay-at-home mom. We lived in a small, lower middle-class town with a very heavy Italian population. Because our high school had a very low graduation rate and almost nobody went to college, my parents decided early on that all three of us were going to be sent to boarding school. What I now view as my first major awareness of being an other came when I went away. Yes, it was based on class and socioeconomic differences. I had never heard of a debutante ball. I had never heard of summering in the Hamptons uh, or needing to wear specific brands of clothes and shoes, including underwear. So it was a very rude awakening, but by the time I graduated, I was more than educated about class systems in the United States. In college, where I was a music honors student, I had to give a recital and write a thesis. In those days, the only careers I was told about were those that you could teach Western European music history or you could be a music librarian. Neither of those appealed to me. As some of you know, during my senior year in the fall, I had two free hours in my honors program, and I took a seminar on North American Indians uh, in which David McAllister came as a lecturer. That's when I heard about ethnomusicology, and that led to my first changing of fields. When I got to Wesleyan in 1962, I became another kind of an other. Wesleyan at that time was still an all-male institution, and the only women who were on campus were there for the MAT program or doing grad work in a few departments. The first year, the 12 of us lived in a co-op house, and the second year, I shared an apartment with two grad students in biology. The Wesleyan ethno program at that point was small and only at the master's level. Bob Brown had established himself and the farm with a very vital program of the music of South India with visiting artists, Friday night gatherings and concerts. McAllister hadn't started bringing in any visiting Native American artists yet, and I was the only graduate student pursuing that specialty, although many Wesleyan seniors and grad students were in my classes. 
For just a minute, let's take a pause and recall the 60s. They were, we've noticed that they were a formative period in ethnomusicology, for sure. But CNN has called the decade a tumultuous period that reshaped America, transforming it from a country of conformity to a land of political, cultural, and social liberation. To just use a few buzzwords, initially the country was in its golden age with JFK as president. But awareness of racial injustices and widespread poverty was increasing, eventually leading to the Equal Pay Act of 1963, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Selma to Montgomery March, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and LBJ's Great Society. But the Vietnam War dragged on, protests increased, and some young people left for Canada while others turned to psychedelic drugs and became hippies or flower children. It was a decade of bell bottoms, beehive hairdos, bikinis, birth control pills, touch phones, eight track tapes, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, the Beatles arrival, and John Lennon. Elvis got out of the army and the popular shows included Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music. At the end of the decade, the bookends in 69 were the gathering at Woodstock and the moon landing. Politically, environmental concerns motivated by Rachel Carson's 1962 book, The Silent Spring, started to gain traction. Mexican-American rights were showcased in a 1966 successful, 66, sorry, successful court case, and gay rights were also starting to be discussed. In 1963, feminism saw the publication of the feminine mystique, and in 1966, the formation of now. In 1968, we had the assassinations of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Red power and black power also started to appear in the late 60s, and they said that by women, uh, by the 68, according to CNN, women's lib was a term that was a household word. While I was at Wesleyan and UNM, I can't honestly say that I was aware of the women's movement, second wave feminism, or even the first wave. I joined, as you heard, I joined SEM in 62, and that was expected of all students in the master's program. What I heard and saw as I started going to conferences was the picture of Patriarchs at Work, which was just shared online in a recent Sound Matters blog. When I saw that picture again, I thought, yep, that's the way it was back in the day. But I also felt sick to my stomach all over again about our sexist roots. I had no training in field work, either at Wesleyan or at UNM. When I asked McAllister about what I should read or learn before going, he said he believed in the sink or swim approach that his teachers at Harvard used. He said, quote, well, you'll either be able to do it or you won't. And if you can't, you'll just come home, quote. When I look back on it, my initial research focus, which McAllister assigned, was definitely gender related. He had an NSF grant to study Blessing Way, the backbone of Navajo ceremonialism. And Blessing Way includes some sub-ceremonies, uh, which also include the wedding, the girls' puberty ceremony, an older rain ceremony, and some other things. David said he needed me to go and investigate the girls' puberty ceremony. Since being a man, he couldn't. The women wouldn't talk to him, and he needed to know about it. So, in almost a repeat of a conversation that we see in our History of Anthro books about the, the initial founders in America discussing whether women would be productive to have as members of anthropology, um, we had the same conversation. I became the handmaiden helpmate who was to go into the field and investigate and study a woman's topic. Obviously, as a grad student, I was very grateful for the opportunity of supported field work, and not yet as a feminist, I did what I was told, and with no field work training either. So that left me to deal with everything, including flirtations, drunken brawls, sexual aggression, 
red power and some singers' hostility to my background, which on my mother's side is Pennsylvania Dutch, which in their minds translated to German and thus a World War II enemy. Because the PhD program at Wesleyan was neither certain nor approved when I finished my master's in 64, despite pleas that I stay and wait, I left, changed fields, and went into anthropology at UNM. I was there on, as, on campus from August 64 through August 68. Then I moved to Carbondale with Ted, whom I had married in August of 65, so he could start his PhD program in anthro at SIUC. Except for being aware of national news during my UNM days, the main issue that affected me during my field work was red power. In certain places on the reservation, it was quite strong, and outsiders were just not welcome. If it resulted in my way being blocked in a trading post or a request being made to a sponsor of a ceremony that I be asked to leave, despite the fact that I was invited to be there, I just left. In much of my field work, I was the only outsider present. But after relationships were established and identities accepted, I didn't have problems most of the time. Due to time constraints, I'm going to fast forward to my awakening. I worked as a social worker for the Department of Mental Health from March of 69 to August 70, rewriting my dissertation at night after we had our first child and we ran out of money, despite Ted's TA and my grant. Since my college minor was psych and I had seriously considered going into music therapy as a career choice my senior year, I found this job stimulating and challenging. When I finally got my PhD in June of 70, the chair of Ted's department at Carbondale called up and asked me if I would like to be considered uh, for an anthro teaching job at the Edwardsville campus. Reportedly, many departments on that campus were about to be nationally censored because they had no women faculty. That summer, SIUE anthro, anthro hired two women, Joyce Ashenbrenner, who started in the summer quarter, and me. Some of you may have known Joyce for her work with Katherine Dunham. I started at SIU in the fall. She and I quickly became friends, sharing an office, although the five men all had their own offices. The department was ruled by good old boys, and everything was done by consensus, no voting. As a discipline, anthropology was just starting to wake up to feminism in the early 70s. Joyce and I were reading, critiquing, and discussing many things. Of course, we soon started taking a look at the department and the university's promotion, tenure, and salary policies, as well as zeroing in on how to teach anthropology itself. It was definitely a time of consciousness raising and political activity. Although the discipline had its Margaret Mead, Bruce Landis, and some other women, and Papa Franz Boas, the father of American anthropology, had always welcomed women, it was very sexist. In the early 70s, American anthropology was going through some arguments between biological determinists and environmentalists, reacting to sociobiology, cognitive anthropology with its emic preferences, and feminism as it emerged. Within a year, Joyce and I, both untenured assistant professors, started bringing up feminist issues in faculty meetings and making it clear that in terms of national discipline-wide developments, it was time that everybody stopped viewing anthropology as the science of man. It was time to stop teaching man the hunter, man the culture bearer, and even more than time to stop evolving man. It was time to challenge assumptions about the universal subordination of women, male dominance, and a lot of other things based on data collected by male field workers talking only to men. This was only the beginning of the confrontations and four very rough years in the department. Within two years, the faculty finally agreed to get rid of textbooks that did not have inclusive language and to use ethnographies in classes that included women as part of the population instead of leaving them in the shadows, footnotes, or totally erased, never to be seen. 
Joyce and I soon joined like-minded women in social sciences and humanities and established an interdisciplinary women's studies program, eventually creating a minor housed in philosophy. We all took turns directing the program and each unit helped develop courses for it. She and I both directed readings in feminism and added feminist works to our own classes as they became available. I wrote some things for a colleague's textbook on feminism and added a unit on sexism in language to my own language and culture class. Both Joyce and I participated in symposia at SIUE and schools in the Metro East. This is also the time when we added our ethnographic field school classes. Awakening as a feminist, of course, meant revising some things on the home front and renegotiating issues like workloads and parenting responsibilities. In June of 72, I had our second daughter. In those days, SIU would not, and I mean not, hold your job if you left to have a baby. I was in spot number one at that point for rotational summer teaching. And so only Ted and Joyce knew that I was pregnant. Very luckily, the second time around, I didn't show at all. And because I wanted my job, I decided I wouldn't teach in the summer, but instead take time off and return to teaching in the fall. When I turned down the highly coveted summer full-time teaching job during a spring faculty meeting, there was a gasp and silence Everybody just looked at me and I said, well, it was for personal reasons. And as soon as the meeting was over, I was called into the chair's office to explain myself. That's when I heard for the second time in my career that this is exactly why we don't like to hire women. All you guys do is go off and have babies and then you quit. I said, nobody was quitting. While all these fun and games were going on at work, in 1972, I helped found the Midwest chapter of SEM, and with the March-April issue, became editor of the newsletter for four years. That job opened my eyes about lots of things in SEM, and as I worked through concerns in anthropology, I started wondering why we weren't also addressing them in ethnomusicology. In 1979, I was elected for the first time to serve on the board of directors as secretary. In the 1980s, I was busy wearing multiple hats, chairing the department, writing grants. I had two big Navajo research projects going, and a colleague and I started Navajo Studies uh, Conference in 86. I was also doing some work on Francis Densmore and Helen Roberts, and as some of you know, in 1986, I started a long-term project on women in the early days of the Society for Ethnomusicology with the goal of learning about all 10 of them. <laughs> Some of my early findings appeared in the 1991 volume, Comparative Musicology and Anthropology of Music, which was edited by Nettle and Bowman. The 1980s decade <coughs> was the time that I did board service for SEM. Starting as second vice president in 84, I became president-elect in 86. That led to serving as president, the third woman to have the job uh, in 87 to 89, and then another year as pre past president. By the time I finished my service on the board, some things had st started to change. As some of you heard during our 2008 FEM 21 gathering, the nightly discussions that Judy McCullough and I used to have in our shared room at SEM in the 70s and 80s had identified a number of issues that needed attention in the society. Gender balancing in the society on all of its committees, slates of officers, programs, and in all of the other endeavors finally started to improve given direct attention and action. In 1987, that was, we had a meeting that I really think was our first one that I can remember having a program that was full of a lot of presentations that were of interest to people who were interested in gender studies. With more time, a women's group uh, was organized, became official, and became the Committee on the Status of Women, which met for the first time in 96 in Toronto. Eventually that committee became a section as did another one, the Gender and Sexuality Task Force, and time rolled on. 
By the late 1980s, it's fair to say that feminism had or was moving out of its second wave into its third wave. Uh, and the focus was becoming broader <laughs> issues, definitely much more global. While we clearly need to recognize the 21st century global world we live in, I also hope we keep track of individuals, their actual lives, and their real problems, whether or not these exemplify international business models. What I'd like to believe is that what we accomplished during the second wave is permanent, but I wonder. It's clear to me now that just like racism, sexism has not been eradicated, but instead it's just gone underground. From experience, I know that at least in some places in this country, backlash is rampant against so-called victories that we had in earlier times. To conclude on a positive note, 2014 brought Ellen's new book, A Feminist Ethnomusicology. And I can happily announce that in the summer of 2016, that'll be next summer, I guess, Anthropology is going to have a new volume, and it will be the first comprehensive cultural anthropological feminist collection to appear since the mid-1970s when works by Rosaldo and Lampier, a writer and others, guided the beginnings of our feminist anthropology. Entitled Mapping Feminist Anthropology in the 21st Century, edited by Ellen Lewin and Lenny Silverstein and being published by Rutgers, the work contains essays by both senior and junior feminist anthropologists cover, covering a wide range, a range of issues. I am sure that this rich volume will be of interest to all of us, no matter who we are or what hats we're wearing. <laughs>